Growing up, my dad used to um, do all sorts of things that irritated me. I wondered why he did the things that he did, and uh, I thought my dad was clueless. I thought my dad was out of step, and the older I get, the more that I find myself doing the exact same things that my father did. And that's what this year's Father's Day video is all about. Check it out. Hey, Dad. What was Grandpa like whenever you were my age? I don't know. He's like a dad. Did Grandpa make you listen to this terrible music? You mean, did he culture me? You bet he did. Did Grandpa get lost too? Sometimes. We're not lost. Recalculating route to your destination. You will arrive in approximately two days, three hours. Of What's your license insurance? Did uh, Grandpa have a lead foot too? Amen. <laughs> Grandpa teach you to pray before every meal like that? Yeah. Before every meal. Did Grandpa do that too? Yeah. You really are a lot like him, aren't you? I hope I'm like you whenever I grow up. What's with all the lollygagging? I'm not paying you guys to sit around and look at pictures. Chop, chop! My stuff's not gonna get to a condo on the golf course by itself. Has Grandpa always been so bossy? Always. Is he actually banging us? Not a chance. <laughs> you really are a lot like him, aren't you? love that video. I love the question it asked there too. How long is your shadow? What kind of legacy are you leaving for your kids? It really has been a great week here, great week at VBS, great week at, uh, in Haiti, uh, at many children placed in their life in Jesus, and now we get to celebrate uh, our fathers. Um, I, I love that video because I don't know a dad uh, anywhere in the world that uh, deep down in his heart doesn't want to leave some kind of a positive legacy that his children can be proud of. And I think many dads would say, you know, I know I've blown it. I know that there's areas in my life that I haven't matched up. I haven't been who I need to be. But deep down, maybe I, I can do things differently or I can, I can be different than who I've been to this point in my life. Good dads think deeply about the legacy that they're leaving behind. A godly legacy is one of the greatest gifts that a father or a mother can leave to their children children. Um, we're taking a break from Luke for a little bit. Um, I know many of you have uh, been kind of tracking with us since December now in our series on Luke, and uh, we're going to take a break through October, till October on that series, because uh, next week is my last Sunday here until after my sabbatical, uh, and you're going to have a great summer of guest speakers who are going to teach the Bible, and uh, they're going to be phenomenal, and I just want to encourage you to, 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 to dive in there. I know some of you won't be here next week, Thank you for this opportunity that you're giving to me and my family to have some time away to refresh and to refocus. And I'm really looking forward to what God is, is going to do in the days and the years uh, ahead here at Woodbury Community Church. But today, I thought it would be appropriate to take a look at what it means to be parents who leave a legacy. I know it's Father's Day, and uh, what we're going to talk about today is applicable for moms, too. It's applicable for 
grandmas and grandpas. It's applicable for those of you who have a role as a spiritual mentor in the lives of someone as well. Years ago, Josh McDowell, who is a phenomenal um, communicator, apologist of the Christian faith, uh, an, an author, a youth speaker, wrote a book about the difference that a dad makes in a family. And the book was called simply The Dad Difference. And it showed that the average teenager in America in those years spent only two minutes a day in meaningful dialogue with his or her father. And that's a statistic that we have certainly heard uh, repeated over and over again throughout the years. 25% of teenagers said that they never had a meaningful conversation with their father in their entire life, meaning to the teenager that they had never had a conversation centered around their interest as teenagers. And so um, some of you understand that. Some of you, that was your experience with your father growing up. When I was a youth pastor in another church, I had a student who played in our youth ministry's worship band, and he was a phenomenal musician. He was artistic. He was um, just, just loved spending time doing all sorts of stuff that his dad had no interest in whatsoever. And his dad was an engineer, his dad was a numbers guy, his dad was a sports guy, his dad loved the Twins and the Vikings, and, you know, and, and so he would take his son with him to the games, but whenever his son would say to him, Dad, would you come in and listen to this song that I wrote? Or would you come in and listen to this song that I'm working on with my guitar teacher? Would you come on and listen to the song that I'm preparing for the worship team at our church? He would... Uh, never get a positive response from his dad. His dad would never come into the room. And I would watch this son from his sophomore through his senior year of high school just become more bitter and more bitter and more depressed and more closed. And uh, when, he, when he started opening up with me, he'd say things like, I just want my dad to spend time with me on the things I'm interested in. I just want my dad to show that he cares a little bit about the things I'm interested in. My dad doesn't care about the things that I care about. He never spends any time investing in the things that I invest in. And I've followed this guy throughout the years. I'm still friends with the dad, and I'm friends with the son, and I talked to the dad about it when I was the youth pastor, and the dad just said, it's just not something I'm going to do. I'm not interested. In it. I'm never going to do it. Just don't try to talk me into doing it. I mean, really? And the kid today has made one negative choice after another negative choice after another negative choice. And I think so much of it goes back to he just wanted his dad's time. Back in the 1970s, Cornell University did a, a study on how much time that preschool age children get to spend with their fathers. And this was way back in the 70s. And you know what the average time was? 44 seconds a day. 44 seconds a day. Now here's the deal. I think dads, our young dads today are doing a lot better than they were back then. I hope that's the case. And I think there's been kind of a, a pendulum swing there to where dads are really trying to make an impact. But we're never going to make an impact in our kids uh, if that's the kind of time that we're spending. Solomon was far from a perfect parent. He was the king of Israel. He was the wisest man to ever live. And anybody who's studied Solomon's life knows he did a lot of boneheaded things for a guy who was the wisest man to ever live. He just... Um, ignored the voice of God multiple times in his life. He made all sorts of moral compromises in his life. And yet, for some reason, um, God used this guy. He did use him to write a book in the Bible called Proverbs, a book that is full of wisdom. Maybe it was a time in his life where he was really walking with God that he wrote this book. It was surely a book that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the words that he shares are good. And at this good moment in his life, he wrote these words in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. And what follows are some incredible verses of just godly wisdom, verses that uh, any of us, if we were to follow them, would live a life that was much better. I mean, the first several chapters of Proverbs are essentially a conversation between Solomon and his sons, Solomon continually encouraging them to pursue wisdom. And I have a question for all of you who are parents or mentors or grandparents. How are you equipping your children or the next generation to live godly lives in their generation? 
And what are your priorities telling your children about what is most important in life? There's no question that it's hard to be a parent. Nobody's perfect. And yet most of us put this expectation on ourselves that we want to be. I mean, we want, when our kids see us, we want them to see us not making mistakes. We know that other parents are watching us, and we sure want to look good. We know that God's watching us, and we want to look good. And yet, as hard as we try, uh, never can be perfect. There's not one of them that comes for Whoever says easy has never been said. It's one of those awesome responsibilities for the eyes of Jesus. And um, we're going to see it through a story that Jesus told. And I told you we're taking a break from the book of Luke, but not really, because we're going to actually go ahead. Several chapters of Luke, right? So look at one parable that Jesus tells in Luke 15, 11 to it's the parable of the five sons, a parable that most of you know is a boy grows up in a wealthy household, he decides that he wants his inheritance when he wants it, and then he runs straight into trouble. He blows his, his entire inheritance on wild living. And while he does it, he's got all sorts of friends. Because everybody wants to be friends with somebody who's given money away. And where it's one single party, that as soon as the money runs out, so do the boys go. And he finds himself in absolutely desperate straits. He's working, cleaning out a pigsty in a foreign country. And that is something that Jesus' Jewish audience would have heard and would have been horrified at. Because a pig was amongst the most unclean of all animals, as far as a Jewish person would have been concerned. He's living in the pigsty, working in the pigsty, and he's so hungry that he actually decides to eat the food comes to his senses and says, you know what, even my father's servants have better food than this. They're treated better than this. And so in verse 20 of Luke chapter 15, we read these beautiful words. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. Perhaps a better title for this parable would be the parable of the loving father. For in this parable, we see a picture of God's love for his children. The real focus of these verses shouldn't be on the prodigal son. It ought to be on the loving father. You know, some of you, as you read those words in verse 20, you can picture those in your minds. You can go back to a time in your life where you were the prodigal. And you wondered if when you came home after years of just breaking your parents' hearts, if they would ever accept you again. And maybe you experienced the grace like the story of the prodigal son shows, or maybe you experienced a hand at the door telling you, I'm sorry, I can't trust you. I'm sorry, you're not welcome here anymore. There's something beautiful about the grace that this father shows. And in this story, there's at least three qualities that we see of a godly father. The first is this. The godly father has a desire to see his family grow in Christ. Now, while the parable doesn't say that directly, it's implied. For the father represented in the parable of the prodigal son is God himself. The father wanted a strong relationship with his son, but his son rejected that relationship. What a vivid picture that even the best parenting can sometimes result in children going astray. I've known parents over the years who've done a way better job than Cindy and me have at raising their kids. And their kids have still chosen to rebel. It's one of the hardest things. It's a mystery in parenting. Not every child is going to stay committed to the spiritual ideals of his, his or her parent. But that being said, it is still the responsibility of a godly father or mother that his or her family would grow in Christ. So how's that done? I suggest a few ways. Number one, prayer. We talk about prayer a lot here at WCC. We believe that prayer is essential in the life of a believer. I believe that what God did at VBS this week, what he did in Haiti, was the result of much prayer. I know there were so many people who were praying. We know that Jesus himself prays for us and continues to plead with the Father on our behalf. Jesus wants us to grow close to him. Prayer is this incredible privilege that so often we um, don't tap into. When Cindy and I were first married, we decided that we were going to do a devotional. And we were going to be that great couple that did their devotions every day and had it all together and 
boy, that was something that we have struggled with. It's a battle throughout our lives, and in our best days, we do really well there. And one of the first books that we read as a young married couple was a book by Patrick Morley called Two-Part Harmony. It's a book that you can pick up on Amazon for like three cents today, and you pay $3.99 shipping, okay? It's, that's, that's the kind of book it is. Uh, it's been around a long time. It's out of print, but it's one that I recommend any couple having on their shelf. The book was one that probably more than any other made us uncomfortable because every single time we'd read a chapter, one or the other of us had some issues that we needed to work out. And it was normally this guy, all right? And so there were things that he'd bring up, and I, I would see these things in my life that weren't quite matching up, and I used to hate the question and answer part because I, I just realized that I have so much work to do, and, and yet it was a good thing, and it was a discipline that was important for us. I will never forget one of the devotionals that we read. I mean, this is 20 years later, and there was a devotional that we read on prayer in that book. And Patrick Morley in the book talked about 20-some things that he and his wife pray for for their children. We um, had, had a little baby at the time, I and mean, that was it, one, one child. I hadn't had two, three, and four yet. And I remember reading this list and being a little bit intimidated by it, but also being inspired by it. And I wrote it down on a piece of paper, and Cindy and I have prayed many of these things. I don't, we don't have the paper anymore. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it, I've got it in a computer file kind of thing. But it's, it's one of those things where we've got this list that we have prayed many of these As parents, I think we look at that and we go, what is wrong with the church? What is wrong with us, you know, that we're not doing a better job here? We need to pray that our kids would have a persevering faith. Let me tell you another statistic. 75% of kids who get involved in using their spiritual gifts, whether they're a junior or senior in high school, and not junior, I'm sorry, junior in junior high or senior high, will find out what their spiritual gifts are and will use them. Those kids don't evacuate the faith. You want to see your kids continue to walk with Christ as they go to college and beyond, then get them involved in using their spiritual gifts. It's another thing that they pray for, to understand their spiritual gifts. They pray for a desire for integrity, a call to excellence, to uh, understand the ministry that God has for them, for values and beliefs, a Christian worldview, to tithe and to save 10% of their income. That their kids would learn to be people who give and would also learn to be people who save to set and work toward realistic goals as revealed by the Lord, that I, as a father, and my wife, as a mother, would set aside time to spend with them, that they would acquire wisdom, protection from drugs, alcohol, tobacco, premarital sex, rape, violence, and AIDS, to pray for the mate that God has for them, alive somewhere and needing prayer. Cindy and I, from the time our kids have been young, have prayed about who, who, who is it that they're going to marry someday. We don't know who they are. We've prayed for that person somewhere in the world. They're growing up, most likely. Um, statistically, our kids will probably get married someday. And so that God would protect and that God would, 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 would work in their lives, that they would come to know him at a young age. And we prayed those things often for our kids. We have uh, prayed that they would uh, do daily devotions, forgiveness, and being filled with the Holy Spirit to glorify the Lord in anything, and then any personal requests that they've discussed with us. Yeah, we don't do that every day. Uh, I don't think there's been a day in years where I prayed all 22 of those things for my kids, but all 22 of those things are things that we pray for our kids on a regular basis. Now, I shared that list with Woodbury Community Church back in 2009. 
And when I shared that list, I think I got more emails that week saying, can I have a copy of that? Can I have a copy of that so I can be praying for that for our kids? And I want you to know, absolutely. Email me. Happy to give you a copy of that. Every week on our website at woodburycommunitychurch.com, you can go to our media page. You can watch the sermon from the last week. And there's always a manuscript to the sermon, too. So you can download that and you can have that list um, later on today if you'd like. It's an amazing list. What do you think God would do if all the parents here were praying that for their kids? And what if those of you who didn't have parents were praying that, they didn't have kids, were praying that for the kids of our church? And what if um, Woodbury Community Church children were bathed with prayer like that? Would it make a difference? I absolutely think it would. Because here's what James 5.16, the second part of it tells us. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And that idea, it says the, 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 that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. Actually, that's the KJV, but I love that. Dads and moms, if we put these principles into practice, we're going to be like the righteous person that James is talking about. Love to see that happen. Of late, um, I have a picture on my iPad that's my picture that I, I get when I open up my iPad. It's a picture of our family that Allie Geyer took about a year ago. And I'll take that picture and I'll pray silently almost every day for every one of the people in my family about the things I know about them. And, uh, and I love that. All right, let me give you three other quick ones. A godly father, a godly mother wants to see, uh, who, who desires to see their family grow in Christ is going to be committed to personal holiness. They're going to be committed to, in their own lives, living a life of integrity, to follow the Lord, to ask the Holy Spirit to empower them. They're going to be people who spend time in God's Word. They're going to bathe themselves in the Word. And you know what else they're going to be committed to? They're going to be committed to Christ. Church is a priority in their life. Living life on life with other people is important. When I was a youth pastor, we started a ministry called Parents in Tune. And it was an opportunity for parents of teenagers to come together and they would talk about issues that parents of teenagers face. And at the end of Parents in Tune, we would always have this open Q&A time. And there were some questions that seemed to get asked over and over again. No matter what month we did it, somebody was new, somebody missed the last one, they raised their hand and they said, hey, I got a question for you. What do you do when your kid doesn't want to come to church anymore? Do you force your kid to come to church and all the parents would all kind of talk about that. They all had different opinions on what you do. You force your kid to go to church. One of the best answers for that came from that same guy who wrote that list of prayer requests. He writes, um, should we force our children to go to school if they don't want to go to school? Um, yeah, I think we force them to go to school. That's an important thing in our life. Why wouldn't we have our kids go to church? The objective of taking your children to church is for them to become followers of Jesus Christ. You cannot follow someone you don't know much about. There are stories of college students who wandered away from their faith only to return because their parents had not given up the habit of meeting together in church. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. So the godly father has a desire to see his family grow in Christ. Godly mother has that desire. It's been said the most significant contribution that we can make in the lives of our children is to give them a heart for God. We can't force them to um, believe and be saved, but we can create the most promising environment possible for that. I would imagine the father of the prodigal son was such a man. He wasn't guaranteed his son would love God, but he had the desire to see his family grow to know Christ. Number two, the godly father is going to go out of his way to show love. When the prodigal son returned home, I'm sure he feared his father's response. I'm sure he braced himself for the lecture. I'm sure um, he was wondering if his father was going to say, like so many fathers did in that culture, I disown you. You are no longer my son. But that wasn't the father of the prodigal son. He doesn't act that way at all. In fact, he acts with a heart of forgiveness that can only come from one who understands how much he has been forgiven by God and how much he needs to show it as well. And he brings him back into the family fold. He throws a party. This is a father who exhibits a divine love, a love that has been touched by God. Divine love is a love that is directed in a number of different areas. Divine love starts with focusing our love upon the Lord. 
If you're a father or a mother who's going to show that kind of love to your children, you need to recognize that your first and foremost responsibility is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. We are incapable of loving our children the way that God wants us to love them if we are not working first and foremost in that relationship with them. Number two, direction that divine love is going to be pointed in is it's going to be pointed toward your spouse. And so one of the greatest gifts that I can give my children is to love Cindy. One of the greatest gifts that Cindy can give our children is to love me. One of the greatest gifts our children can see is a father and a mother who love one another. Is that what you're doing? Are you, are you, are you pointing in that direction? Uh, number three, we need to point our direction in the love of our, our love in the direction of our children. True love is never going to be shown in 44 seconds a day. It's not going to be shown in less than two minutes of conversation a day. And I recognize that every one of us get busy. Every one of us have demands. Every one of us have times when we're away for a season for work or we're traveling or we're doing whatever. But we need to make it a priority to spend meaningful time with them. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. We can't bring people up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord without time. Divine love is fourthly pointed at others. Teach your children to be servants. Model for them what it means to help other people. One of the great joys of my life as a dad has been taking my children on mission trips. This week, Jeremy, our third child, joined Cindy and me on the mission field in Haiti, and I loved watching what God was doing in his life. He said one of the most profound things this week as uh, we were talking about what God was doing in our lives, and he taught me as his dad, and I loved it, loved it. Cindy and I made a commitment years ago with our kids that we wanted to bring our kids on the mission field like every year, and it didn't happen. And, you know, we had to readjust our expectations. But we said, you know, before they graduate from high school, we'd love the opportunity for a one-on-one kind of mission trip experience with our kids to walk with that. And so Chris was the first of our kids to do it. He was in seventh grade, and he joined me and a bunch of high school students in Guatemala. And it was a formative week in his life and in my life as his dad an opportunity to see what the third world was really like, to see what real poverty looked like, to see what real joy looked like in the midst of that, to see his worldview kind of rocked and shaped. And then Brianna and I, when we came to Woodbury Community Church, had an opportunity to go together to Mexico. And we got to build houses, and we got to, um, you know, meet the people. And my daughter, who loved Spanish, got to speak the language like she never had before, totally enculturated in Mexican um, culture, speaking Spanish 24-7 as much as she could with the people. And you know what she's going to be today? A Spanish teacher. And on another mission trip, she went to the inner city of Chicago, not with me or Cindy, but with a bunch of students from Woodbury Community Church. And while she was in Chicago, she got her heart just broken for the people of the city. She got her heart broken for um, just the challenges of, of education in an urban setting. She made a commitment when she went to college to go on a teach grant where she would give several years to teaching in a low-income or urban school. Those things change lives. I love seeing my kids and my wife and I trying to devote our lives in the service of others because it's what Jesus tells us to do. And finally, divine love has got to be pointed at ourselves too. If we can't love ourselves, we're going to be incapable of loving others. We need to recognize that we're created in the image of God with infinite worth and value. Okay, finally, the godly father lives intentionally, avoiding being sidetracked by the agendas of others for his family. Anybody can get sidetracked if you're not careful. In the parable of the prodigal son, the loving father had an opportunity to be sidetracked when he was confronted by, of all people, his own son, his oldest son. You see, after the prodigal returned home, the father was so overjoyed that he threw him a party, and that didn't please the son who had been so obedient over the years. Look at verse 25. Now his oldest son was in the field, and as he came and he drew near the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant, and he said to them, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound, but he was angry and refused to go in, and his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad, 
For this brother was dead and he's alive again. He's been found. He who was lost is, is found. The father's beautiful response in verses 31 and 32 tells us that he knew what he was trying to accomplish in his son's lives and he wasn't going to be distracted. The greater thing here was that he had a son who needed to be restored and brought back into fellowship. And he was going to take that opportunity no matter what anybody else thought about it. And he was going to do the right thing. And it's part of a series of parables where Jesus talks about lost things being found. And it relates specifically to the fact that all of us are prodigals. And he's the loving father. And every one of us have been in a spot in our life where we've been rebellious toward our Heavenly Father. And He continues to stand at the window, and He continues to pursue, and He continues to call, and He has such incredible joy, incredible joy, when we turn back to Him. Nothing is ever going to deter the Father from that great spiritual purpose from our lives. And dads, we need to do the same thing. Moms, we need to do the same things. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 says, And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. You, you, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your heart, ha house and on your gates. Whose responsibility was it? to see to the spiritual care and nurture of children, first and foremost in the Old Testament and the New? Parents. And too often we have outsourced the spiritual development of our kids to churches or Christian schools or social clubs or sports or any number of other things, not recognizing that it is our great responsibility, first and foremost, as parents to do that. Listen, Woodbury Community Church, we count it an honor to come alongside of moms and dads and the spiritual development of their kids. We've got a great children's ministry who've had a wonderful week here. We've got a great youth ministry. Many of our youth served this week there. The youth that were in Haiti, Jim said it. We were so proud of them. They were incredible this week. But we're partners with moms and dads. We're coming alongside of you. But that nurturing, that, that great job, that has been given to us by the Father is first and foremost yours. And so we want to do everything we can, moms and dads, to equip you to live the life that God has called you to. So if you go online this week and you download the sermon, I've got a little bonus in there for you. And the little bonus is, I love my mom and dad, I do. And they did lots of things wrong, I'm sure, over the years. And there's all sorts of books that have been written over the years of things that my parents did wrong and all the things they screwed up on. I saw a book a bunch of people wrote years ago, though, called Things My Parents Did Right. And um, I decided years ago, I just wanted to write down, jot down on paper, what are some of the things that my parents did right for me? And I put a list of like 25 things down, and I've got that at the end of the sermon this week that made an impact in the lives of my brothers and my sister and me. And, and I hope they'll be a blessing to you. Um, parenting's hard. Parenting's hard. But it's a great job. And we've got a God who can equip us to do it right. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the privilege that you give us as your children to have a model in you who is perfect. And Lord, there's plenty of us here today who have blown it as moms and dads. Lord, I've shared with the church some of the really good things that Cindy and I have done as parents, but we could sure share a whole lot of bad things that we've done too, ways that we've blown it. Lord, help all of us to be people who look first and foremost to you as being our model. To be people who are living lives that are dependent upon you. Lord, I pray for our fathers today. I thank you for that. God, the Bible tells us the, the, the incredible importance that a father has in his family. The, the responsibility that, that men have to um, be these spiritual leaders in a home, and I pray that you would help the men of WCC to, to take that seriously and to run with that, to be people who will pursue you and model that. I pray for uh, those who are here today and they're growing up without dads here. His dad has left, he's abandoned the family, or some other thing has happened. And I pray, Lord, that they would be able to see uh, in you a father who will never fail them, pray that as a church that men would step up and be there for uh, boys and girls who need um, a spiritual father here on earth.
may we be people who, who will uh, provide that and be that. God, where we're weak today, we ask you to, to fill in that you would be our strength. And we thank you today for every one of the dads that on this Sunday, this beautiful day, have set aside time because you are a priority to them. Bless them this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we close in worship.